Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see so many people still being around. It's late, right? If you have been here the whole day, it's, uh, it's impressive that you're staying. But I think the topic of the day, the topic of that panel is really fascinating. And there's a real reason why we say uh, blockchain, the future of finance, right? Uh, 12 months ago, the same presentation would have required us to say Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, luckily, we are beyond this, but probably this is also something we have to discuss. I was kind of making this little uh, conversation discussion earlier here with the panel that I was at a, a presentation earlier this year where the uh, president of the German Central Bank said, well, this c c uh, cryptocurrency thing hasn't proven yet to be uh, sustainable, right? It could be a bit like the umbrellas for shoes or the butter stick where you can spread butter on toast, kind of like a Brit, a Brit stift for the Germans. Uh, very useful uh, innovations, but they haven't been successful, they haven't been adopted, right? I think this is a presentation in a couple of years or so you, you actually don't want it to see recorded because that might be a major mistake to, to kind of refer to uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain like a not so useful innovation. A few words about myself. I'm a professor at IT University in Copenhagen for IT management and uh, innovation and leadership, right? Um, since two years, uh, we have a fintech center where we are doing research together with the Copenhagen Innovation and uh, Finance region and with uh, the local banks over there. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here, but this is enough about myself. Let me introduce you uh, to our panel. Here we have uh, on the left-hand side from you, uh, no, here, Sebastian Apple. Sebastian Apple, he's an expert in innovation and emerging technologies and has more than seven years of experience in different roles within financial services with a strong focus on strategy, technology, monitoring and innovation. Currently, he is, uh, his current company, Iruka Labs, supports financial services uh, companies to identify and adapt breakthrough technologies to relevant business problems. Then we have uh, Jutta Steiner, Dr. Jutta Steiner, founder and COO of ETHCORE, I'm not sure if I pronounced it, ETHCORE, located in London. Uh, its mission is to overcome trust boundaries in businesses, finance and trade. And she also oversaw the IT security audit for the Ethereum Foundation before she launched, uh, of, before the launch of the public blockchain. In the middle we have Mark Banecker. He is a serial entrepreneur and a fintech investor and is a venture partner at Orange Growth Capital in London, which is an investment company with specialization and focus on the fintech market. Then we have Andre Marchuk. Yeah, good. Uh, he has been the co-founder and CEO of Yakuna AG, a Zurich-based company focused on blockchain and smart contracts and uh, cryptocurrencies. Before that, he was chief architect and head of software development of click and buy for over 15 years. And last but not least, Dr. Robert Bosch. He's partner and uh, in his partner financial services and member of the banking and capital markets group at Bearing Point here in Frankfurt. He has more than 15 years of experience in corporate strategy, capital market processes and capital market compliance and currently responsible for an innovation team developing possible applications for blockchain solutions in the capital market. So this is kind of the, uh, a quick introduction into the panel to have more time to let each of the panelists now have a, a, a kind of a, a position statement, three minutes each, maybe four minutes, to illustrate to us why they personally believe that blockchain is truly a revolutionary force, a disruptive force, which is creating the future of finance. And uh, maybe we start with uh, Dr. Bosch, because I mentioned you last. Oh, thank you then. <laughs> Okay, good evening. Um, yeah, blockchain technology is a technology will, which uh, will significantly um, change the way how we are going to create financial instruments in the future, how we're going to um, process payments, how we're going to clear and settle instruments, um, how forest, uh, forex markets are functioning. So this is um, truly out of my personal view, uh, the most disruptive technology we saw for a long time. We're going to see uh, new products, we're going to see um, new players in the market. We're going to also see established players um, changing or even disappearing from the market. Many intermediaries, um, clearing houses, custodians, trading platforms, maybe central banks or other centralized ledgers will uh, rethink their business models. 
So, um, yeah, I think that's quite a strong statement. So when is that going to happen? I cannot tell you. It depends a lot on when this, um, when this uh, technology really gets into the market. Can take um, quite a short period, may, maybe take some more years. I think it's a rather a matter of how it's going to um, get into the market, this technology. Out of my point of view, it's going to be a kind of evolutionary process in, a, in certain areas. Um, it's not going to be a big bang, maybe some small bangs around. We will see this. So what is actually needed? What is the prerequisite that this is really going to happen? Um, what it needs is kind of a um, standard, a kind of a technical global standard. Um, which enables the players to design, to define so-called financial contracts. Um, one firm, actually it's, a, it's a, a bearing point startup, is working on this. It's Eleven's uh, Digital Finance. They are uh, developing exactly a platform to, um, on a kind of a global standard, you can uh, compare that with Swift, to, um, to define it, to design it, to create those um, financial contracts. Um, so when you and, and this and this again will enable say what, what I said in the beginning it will change the way and the, the products as well. This will be the foundation for um, currencies, and I'm not talking about um, currencies, um, uh, cryptocurrencies. I'm talking about um, existing currencies, but in a, a digitalized form. Um, and then, of course, you, that, that, that's quite obvious, um, bonds, uh, stocks, um, and the way how um, clearing and settlement will um, process in the future will be um, very different in this um, world. So it's quite obvious to see and what you read a lot about um, what is actually kind of the business case. Um, there are numbers around of tens of billions of uh, cost saving potential in the clearing and settlement area. To be honest, I um, really believe that. So, um, in my point of view, and this is um, it, it quite, it's quite an abstract um, thing, was what this um, f um, uh, fintech does, but this is going to be the battle of the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Please continue with your three minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, why I love uh, Bitcoin or blockchain. I started my career uh, 15 years ago as software developer. Yeah, and with blockchain, I discovered first time for me uh, really programmable money. Uh, that's what we missed uh, the whole time for um, uh, Internet of Things or for smart contracts. Yeah, we discussing at the university since 20 years such things, but nobody could uh, uh, could deliver the technology. Yeah. And with blockchain, I can handle money uh, like uh, every data. I can attach it, attach it to email. I can uh, program a contract and pay the contract uh, with the money. I can send it uh, in seconds uh, around the world. Yeah? And this is really the uh, first time we have, uh, we have this possibility. Um, and financial transactions are really uh, glue for our real life. And we started digitalize our life years ago, you know, 30 years ago, with first personal computers, with mobile phones, with smartphones. Now we have uh, self-driving cars, uh, but we just have our old money, our old financial um, uh, transactions. Uh, but blockchain closes this gap and allows us uh, to. Uh, uh, to start to use uh, financial transactions in digital, in new digital technologies. Uh, uh, there are a lot of projects are already in place uh, based on blockchain in non-financial industry, non-financial uh, world. Uh, there are projects in notary services, in provenance proof, uh, in um, uh, real estate. It's not really financial uh, areas, but all these areas use uh, financial transactions. And currently, uh, it is incom incompatible with, uh, with our old money. And only with blockchain, blockchain ideas, blockchain-based technologies uh, based on, uh, uh, on top on blockchain solve this problem. Yeah. So that's why I love it.
Thank Good. You. Thanks a lot. Mark, why do you think it's a disruptive technology for the finance sector? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I started my first uh, internet company 16 years ago, and I have to say the whole blockchain development feels really very similar. You have uh, completely new ways of, of, uh, of doing things in general. I mean, it's also uh, combined with a lot of coverage in the media. A lot of people talk about it, but at the end, if you're honest, nobody really knows what's really going to happen. So I think that's a little bit uh, very similar to the, to the times back then when the whole digital revolution started to begin. And I think we all saw what happened in the last uh, 16 years. So, uh, I mean, all the people looking at their smartphones right now, I mean, it's really a completely different uh, time. And I think uh, the blockchain technology has the potential to uh, go through a similar process as a base for a completely new way of how we interact, of how, I would say, at the end, the whole existing legal uh, setup is, is, is based. And, uh, I mean, you already mentioned it in the beginning, it's, it's going much deeper than into just the payment space uh, with Bitcoin or other uh, virtual currencies. It's really about uh, how uh, contracts are made, how uh, interactions between uh, humans, um, corporates are, 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 uh, are constructed. And that's why I think at the end it's an extremely powerful way um, of uh, digitization, uh, digitization of, um, of value chains. Um, but as I, as I said in the beginning, at the end, it's a little bit, we're really at the beginning of this whole development. And I have to say, from an investment perspective, it also feels a little bit similar like, like a few years ago. You see a lot of very smart, very intelligent, very motivated young entrepreneurs. And when you look at their business cases, um, yeah, it's disruptive, it's efficient, it's changing a lot. But quite often you don't see a real business case behind it. And I think... That's why I'm also a little bit skeptical about a few of these players. I mean, there were a lot of companies before Google and Facebook, uh, which did exactly the same. So I think we're a little bit too early to really see um, what's going to happen. So that's why I would say the real big winners will still um, uh, need some more time. And it's also interesting to see that we have, for example, in Souk, the Crypto Valley Souk. So there are now, I mean, you're also part of it, a uh, few developments where you have a cluster. Of this, of this of this whole blockchain technology and it's not just in the Silicon Valley. So that's also, I think, good for Europe that uh, in this field with all the legacies in the US uh, with the Snowden stories and similar, uh, similar problems, I think we have a real chance to be uh, ahead of the curve. Hopefully this time we will talk about this a bit more later. Uh, Jutta, coming back to this kind of disruptiveness of blockchain, and sometimes we are talking about the emergence of the trust-free economy. Yeah. So um, if you ask me what we are doing at Ethcore, at, at this company, um, there are two ways of telling the story. So I could either say we are building kind of the most advanced blockchain platform, as The Economist said two or three weeks ago. Um, but if you ask me what does it mean for finance, but also for society, I would say we're actually building a machine that allows us, a like a computer, a, a, a digital machine that allows us to, um, to solve the problem of trust in the way how we do um, businesses, how we trade with each other, how we collaborate with each other. So to give you a feeling um, of what I mean, I, I think it's uh, instructive to, to go a bit um, beyond the finance space. So I myself originally started working on a project um, in supply chain transparency to figure out how, how can we use blockchain technology in order to actually get assurance that like a product is organic or that there's no child labor um, or ch children being exploited in the, in the supply chain. So the problem with all this is you have separate um, entities and actors in the supply chain that all don't trust each other, They're set, it, which, reflects, which is reflected in the, in the siloed servers that don't talk to each other, you have no way of verifying um, the claims that are made um, to you as an end consumer. And so when, when it comes to business cases, um, actually FSC, the big, um, the big certification agency who certifies wood, they, for example, spend about 100 million per year um, only to do the paperwork of certifying, of verifying that there wasn't fraud going on. And still they claim, or they, they say they can't guarantee that. So, um, yeah, I mean, what we've seen, I mean, we have seen that digital has, has changed a lot in society, has changed a lot in society. 
but I do strongly believe that, um, that this technology will change the way how we collaborate by bringing down the cost for coming to agreements, for executing these agreements, for getting assurance um, and whatnot. So if you ask me, when will it revolutionize finance? I don't know, it's a highly regulated space. Um, is it here to stay? Definitely, and, and we're seeing like applications in other spaces already. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Sebastian? Yes. If, um, when I look at uh, blockchain, um, I think it's a very interesting case uh, of technology adaptation. Um, underlying blockchain um, technology, there is technology like a public key cryptography and hashing functions, and those things have been published 30 years ago. They have been around for quite a while. Um, people in Germany, uh, since 2010, on your ID card issued from the government, there's a chip that can execute public key functionality, but a lot of people I know are just not using it, and even less companies are using it. So that technology was there quite a long time, but it has not been taken up for really a long time as well. And then something interesting happened when uh, Bitcoin entered the picture uh, 2009, because Bitcoin did two things. One is they combined these technologies that are around for, for a really long time in an interesting way that is called the blockchain now. And the other thing they did was they connected this technology to, to something people care about for a long time, and that's money. And since then, people have gathered interest in this technology, and the momentum that is there has been growing from tech enthusiasts to venture capital people, and what I see now is a really strong momentum. We had it earlier in the discussion. It is quite hard to, to keep the overview about all the projects that are going on, all the startups that are in this field. There is so much momentum out there that something very interesting is going to happen. And I agree with um, all the statements. It's very hard to predict where this is going to happen, but something is going to happen. And if I put myself in the shoes of a CEO of a large financial services company, I would, I would have three questions in my mind, and that's how will this technology impact my lines of businesses? The other is um, what are the areas where I just want to react to what's going to happen? And what are the areas where I want to build the future in the way I want it to be, where I can make sure I have a seat on the table when the new cards are going to be dealt. And in the end, why, why is my choice the best choice I can make for my shareholders? Okay, thanks a lot. Well, if we look at the kind of the, the momentum and the, the dynamic in the market, right? So if you, if you talked about fintechs, a year or two years ago in a, in a financial environment, uh, banks typically reacted saying, oh, they are not on the same uh, playing field, right? Because they are not regulated as we are. So in the meantime, fintechs are serious and they are taken serious and are driving banks. If you look at the fintech-driven uh, innovations uh, based on blockchain, now again, the banks are sort of kind of driven by those uh, movements and are rather late in the game, right? Most of those large banks now uh, f um, formed in, a, in a R3, that's a consortium to kind of jointly do research in, in blockchain in all kinds of different areas. Beyond the, pl the payment and the currency topic, what is the next business uh, model, the next kind of business process which will be affected by those fintech-driven innovations in the traditional finance world? So, going back to what I said as, a, as an opening statement, I think any process that involves like tedious, laborious um, human processes um, in order to create trust, audits, whatever that may be, um, these are, for example, in trade finance where, where you have to check, oh, has the shipment actually been, um, been dispatched? Is it, has it arrived at the port? Um, such processes that, that are nowadays paper-based and extremely costly will be changed. And in addition, it will allow um, 
uh, the application of such um, such um, risk measurements that you see in trite finance, for example, for cases um, where the costs in order to apply such such um, tools are right now way too high. Other comments? Uh, yeah, in addition, uh, additionally, we can say uh, we are currently uh, uh, exchanging human-based systems through uh, computer-based or machine-based systems. And uh, it will uh, take time, but uh, as, as Utah uh, already uh, mentioned, it's extremely uh, costly processes uh, in the uh, old school uh, uh, organizations and um, the uh, projects or technologies uh, for exchanging such, such processes. So, uh, uh, will uh, will be the next hype, I think. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, the the issue of trust is very relevant right now, and there I don't see any underlying law framework that will help you when you want to use the technology. So right now, you have to agree with your business partner. What does it mean if we use this technology and certain information information is exchanged? And this is why I think the first applications are going to be in areas where there is enough value in a, in a, in a relationship of few people so the technology can enable cost savings or new business in that area. Well, we also see that the financial regulatory authorities like the state of New York or the Bank of England, they all have already issued first kind of frameworks and, and concepts how to deal and re regulate kind of cryptocurrencies, right? So, but this raises the general question, what is the role of those institutions in the future? Because, of course, a central bank was there to uh, provide trust to the system as a trust agent. So if we look at the regulatory side in the financial world, how has the regulator to change in the future to actually kind of uh, keep its importance or kind of modify its current, law, current role uh, according to these developments driven by blockchain technologies? How is the regulation changing in the future, or should change? Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, extremely important that you have this, let's say, bigger legal framework uh, involved into the whole process, because at the end, I mean, everybody knowing uh, the power of blockchain realizes that we have a lot of processes where we have lawyers, notaries, whatever, uh, just to create this trust. On the other hand, also, if it's much more efficient, cheaper, better, whatever, you're still not able, I mean, I can't sell my house to you using blockchain because at the end um, the system is not made for that yet. So I think that's why, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like the, the framework you have to have to be able to use the power of this uh, new technology. So that's why I think even more than the existing financial institutions, it's about the regulation being open uh, and I think when you look at the costs and the inefficiencies, it makes sense on the long run that you implement these new possibilities in uh, all these kind of interactions and legal legal transactions. Yeah, yeah maybe just to add, add one thing. Um, the regulator, of course, will keep keep his um, task to, to assure a kind of a, a fair and um, fraud-free economic um, process landscape. Um, yes, it is a challenge. It is going to be a challenge for them also. I mean, we saw many fintechs with um, very uh, different business cases. All of that are real um, challenges, but um, the new technology is going to help them as well. So when we think about, you just touched that too, the smart contracts. And when, when some smart contracts start um, getting used, when, when that is a part of our um, exchange life or a life um, and paying anything, maybe even a house or um, um, shares or whatever, then this technology will support um, actually their tasks as well. Yeah, I very much agree just from the discussions we are having with regulators in the UK, but also in Asia, especially in Singapore, they are very much embracing this technology in order to, to make their life simpler in trade finance, for example. I mean, they have a fund of more than 200 million um, to to uh, do research in the technology. Now, from a startup point perspective, like I wish that regulation would not like chase off the technology before it actually had the time to to flourish. Like as a mathematic math, math, math as a um, trained as a math, mathematical physicist, I sometimes feel like somebody is kind of building 
a regulatory institute for physics but, and then tries to regulate like gravity. That's sometimes how I feel when people talk about this technology. So kind of going against the nature instead of, as we see it in some countries, embracing what you can do good with it. We, we already kind of touched on the point that this might be an area where Europe can actually develop something and it's not just uh, lagging behind or is kind of following what's coming out of the US. Um, we talked about the regulation in, the, in, in Europe. Um, do you really think that Europe can kind of have a leading role in the development of blockchain-based solutions or is that something else where we are getting kind of dictated the, the solution from the states, right? So is, are there some specific strengths, kind of engineering background in, 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 in Europe so that we can actually use the blockchain technology to develop something rather than being, being driven by the de uh, developments from outside Europe? From my perspective, it's, um, uh, it comes again uh, back to the trust thing that needs to be established. And regulators have had a large role in bringing also trust to the system because they made sure that everybody who acted in the system did that in a way that was defined and, and in, a, in a good way, not frauding people um, with the trust that they placed in the company. So um, for, for Europe, the regulators and, and the system can have a very active role in, in laying the foundations for the technology that's currently not there and that individual players need to build and are building currently with a lot of work and a lot of lawyers involved. So I think there is a great opportunity to lay a foundation that is there to, yep. to last. But this question has a, a great uh, or huge conflict inside because uh, if we are dealing with blockchain, uh, we deal with a technology which uh, destroys borders. Yeah? It's like email. We don't care about uh, sending email abroad. Yeah? It's uh, email destroyed borders, uh, Skype destroyed borders. In the same way, uh, blockchain destroys uh, such artificial borders and uh, connected the whole world in, uh, in this way. And uh, it doesn't matter what uh, Germany, Switzerland, UK uh, would say or regulate, we need a worldwide regulation. And this is a mental shift yeah, we have to do or the regulatory authorities have to do. Yeah? And this conflict is uh, not solved now. I was talking more about what we can do, not from a regulatory point of view, but how we can develop solutions, right? So it's kind of, do we, and this is of course something without boundaries, kind of this is a, a European or international uh, approach. Um, but at this, this point, I would like actually to invite the audience to uh, bring forward some questions because there must be questions in the audience given the huge number of people who showed up for, for this session. Uh, before we kind of continue kind of asking our own questions, I would like to involve the audience are there any questions for the panel over there? So, uh, thank you. I would have a question for Dr. Jutta Steiner. Do you think that Ethereum network, it will make the race? Or will it lose to Bitcoin? Because first mover advantage versus a better and more sophisticated platform, not always the more sophisticated platform can win out, especially if it's a net effect good. Yeah, so I mean, I've, we've, I've had this discussion several times. I mean, there are use cases for bit Bitcoin. I mean, that, that, uh, we've, that we ourselves have used Bitcoin in order to raise um, um, money initially to develop the first um, stages of the technology. We raised 15 million just using Bitcoin and it wouldn't have been possible to do it otherwise. Um, but um, I sometimes feel like people are just trying really hard and stick to, stick to this technology just because it was there in the first place. So I, I do believe there's way, well, like a lot of space for improving the technology. And yeah, I think um, I'm not sure whether Bitcoin can make it. <laughs> Any other questions over there? And maybe you can say who you are before you start your asking your question. Yeah. My name is Christian. Uh, I'm a student, MBA student at the M uh, Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And uh, I wanted to ask, the topic was not raised or maybe the question was a void, but I would like to know what is the base value of uh, the, this digital currency? 
Well, the question wasn't avoided, actually. What we tried here at the panel was kind of going beyond the cryptocurrencies, right? So we don't want to talk about fiat money and cryptocurrencies, because that brings us back to the discussion we quite often have as being panelists, that we talk about Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin. We try to actually illustrate the omnipotential of blockchain. And, and the, the, the cryptocurrency is just a, a, a tiny thing in this universe, right? We are not talking about the fiat money problem or something like that. But if you wanted to answer that question, please. Well, I think there's a very easy answer. So the value is trust, for, and that um, actually applies for every currency in the world. It applies for euros, dollars. It's just a piece of paper you have in your pocket. Imagine that. <laughs> Excuse me. With all due respect, I don't think that the euro and the US dollars is just a piece of paper. I think that uh, <laughs> uh, was there is a value a behind bit, yeah. that. There is a production. There is a country uh, behind that. There is a demand and a supply. And there's belief. In trust, we in, in God we trust. Are there are there other questions? Oh, there's a question over there. Yes, thanks, um, Julius. I'm a master student from Augsburg. Um, so we've heard a lot about blockchain and less about smart contracts. So um, I would like to know if you see the next wave of fintechs uh, written as smart contracts, sort of living on a blockchain. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with the Ethereum we are building, well, we built the first operating smart contract platform. And I mean, that this, is, this goes back to um, how will we do agreements in the future. So instead of like writing down first everything in Word and then reinterpreting, I think there's massive potential for simplifying this, directly integrating it into the digital processes we have um, anyhow. And so there's a direct link and the smart contract pen can be used um, very efficiently. And for everybody involved in the agreement, it's 100% clear how to interpret this agreement. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, in terms of blockchain, uh, do you think regulators are a bit wary about blockchain as a technology, especially in Germany? Because uh, I, I was watching a couple of uh, conferences across in, on YouTube, and uh, I don't remember who the speaker was, but uh, one of the comments that was made was uh, one should view, I mean, regulators are not really uh, comfortable about the idea of blockchain as a technology. Is, th is that really true? Or do you think there is a hindrance to blockchain if we talk about German markets? I think in general it's just a matter of fact that I would say most people working in these departments don't really understand what blockchain is. I mean, at the end, uh, as we heard before, uh, if you really understand uh, the power and the whole system of blockchain, I think it would uh, extremely support uh, the, a lot of the, of the actual activities of the regulator. But if, I mean, if you just read about the bad Bitcoin stories and you think just blockchain is somehow the technology of Bitcoin, seems to be even worse. So um, I think the, it, there's a lot of, lot of uh, missing uh, information and I think that's why some articles in the, in the broad media could help but sometimes also the journalists don't know all the details so that's why it's about now understanding how it works and I mean to be honest when, when the whole internet started it was also about, about child porn and just weird people surfing on the internet so I think we see also as I mentioned in the beginning, a very similar uh, development. Okay, so there is a need of know-how here, if, if I understood correctly. Definitely. I mean, as I said, 1999, who was in the internet, you read, I mean, you can go to the archives and look at the articles. I mean, the internet was a little bit like a weirdo thing for nerds, and I think that changed a little bit in the last few years. All remarkable regulators in Europe already started uh, uh, this work. Yeah, it it will be a long, a very long way yeah, to finish this, but uh, uh, there is no uh, no way back. And it feels sometimes even like there's a regulatory competition. Like those who understand actually um, support the technology and try to um, derive an like advantage for for their country. By, um, by giving good um, and favorable terms to startups, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And um, if you look at the uh, European banking authorities, they have published a report six months ago on, on the technology. So I think there is an awareness there, and that, but it still will need to take time to, to build the platform that's, that's supporting the technology, the legal platform. Well, especially this technology has um, actually the power to build very transparent markets, and that's especially what um, regulators are looking for. If there are no further questions. What can incumbent companies, banks currently in the market do to protect their market share? Kind of, if they are driven by fintechs and if they are driven by blockchain driven solutions and uh, they, they right now have a hard time to bring the know-how. I mean, we talked about the lack of know-how. Know-how is key here, right? So on, for the regulatories, uh, regulatory authorities, for the banks, for all players. And uh, know-how is on short supply, right? So only a few people right now have really deep understanding what that is. Many kind of talk only about that. So how can banks or kind of existing players actually innovate to, to kind of survive this game? Well, out of my point of view, there's just one question. They need to collaborate. Um, actually, we have asked this exactly this question to um, a bank. We had a survey beginning of the year, and we asked them actually what their actually strategic position is. It was a um, little uh, st um, survey on we call it digital banking. And um, actually, mo not most of them, but like a, a, um, a smaller majority, so about 55 percent, something like that, actually were on the strategic um, position to, to collaborate. Others were on 45 then on, on competing. I think it's going to be really wrong to compete. Mm. Yeah. And I can tell tell you what banks uh, should not do. They uh, shouldn't um, overhype the technology. It's a really exciting and uh, revolutionary technology, but uh, my feeling uh, just now, uh, it's overhyped. Uh, the banks should start to better understand the technology before uh, creating uh, bold uh, press lines. I would agree, it's about understanding the technology currently and as a, as, a, as a bank, I wouldn't worry about startups. I would worry about what is uh, the fifth, sixth, seventh uh, bank in terms of market share going to think and do because they know the market already. They probably know they will have a hard time growing their market share because it's already divided. But there is an opportunity for those players who have knowledge, who also have cash, to mix the cards new. And I would worry about them and think through what will be my options and also decide, do I want to react or do I want to, to lead and make the game? Yeah. Uh, one last round view, if there are any further questions. If that's not the case, um, uh, kind of a question for all of you. Um, if you had to put all your money in a blockchain-based fintech idea, what would that be? Well, most, of it. <laughs> most of it, of course, I would put in 11's digital finance, but uh, I guess not everything. <laughs> okay. I think uh, everyone in this round already put uh, his money into blockchain-based business. But if I uh, would answer this question just, just now, I, I cannot focus. There are a lot of really uh, good ideas and good products. Yeah? I would try to distribute it across. Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't put it into a specific idea or project. It's at the end about the passion of the founders. So like in all the other very successful cases we saw in the last few years in the web business, I think it's more about the uh, people behind an idea and less about the idea because there are always a lot of ideas around us, but it's at the end about the people building a substantial business out of it. Yeah. Yeah, same. I mean, we based most of what we built initially was without any funding in the first six months of, um, of 2014. Um, so just on our like small personal funds. Um, but like going f forward, I think. 
the most innovative things are, are still to come. Um, although, yeah, I'm of course invested in my own startup. <laughs> Um, I, I would totally agree. I would not put uh, all the eggs in one basket. If I need to choose a basket, I would uh, currently select an infrastructure basket, something horizontal that enables the other verticals, um, but it's very hard to, to select a vertical and put all, all the eggs there. Good. This brings us to an end. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to the panelists for, for being with us today. And I, I think all of us, we will kind of continue having a close focus on the blockchain development in the market because there is a lot to come and this will be interesting for all of us. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>